What's going on? This is King Cam with Jumbay's podcast. Jum Jumbay needs messages. And today's message is the Forgotten Queen of Ethiopia, Empress Zuditu. Now, some of you guys may be very familiar and knowledgeable about the history of Ethiopia and the, the, the dynasties and different kings and queens that reign there. This is new to me. But before we get into that, uh, once again, thank you for tuning in. And thank you for listening. And let's lay the foundation, right? In the ancient world, the country of Ethiopia has been one of its mainstays. Since day one, Ethiopia has always been the power, right? The Bible calls it the land of Kush. Ethiopia is the oldest independent country in Africa. Uh, no country has have, have had that long lasting um, rulership. It is also the second oldest Christian nation in the world after Armenia. The country of Ethiopia is one of the longest lasting systems of kingdoms and monarchies in the known world. The predecessor, Emperor Hail Selassie uh, of uh, Empress Zoditu was born April 29, 1876. Uh, she was the early symbol of women's independence, whose end is shrouded in mystery. Uh, we're going to summarize a little bit of the ascending of major kingdoms of Ethiopia, its monarchs, vision of the country, as well as summarize the life of our empress. Ethiopia is the world's 27th largest country, uh, a little larger than the state of Texas. It is situated in the Horn of Africa, south of Egypt and west of Somalia. But let me pause right there to let you guys know that Ethiopia was not always this size. Um, the Nile River, uh, however long the Nile River flowed, that's where Ethiopia was. And so uh, it wasn't until the Berlin Conference when they shattered our African nations and people and made them into these smaller states mainly to maintain control. Now, the neighboring countries of Kenya, uh, Eritrea, Somalia, and Sudan uh, surround Ethiopia. Now, according to CIA.gov, the geographical coordinates is 800 north by 1,800 east. Ethiopia uh, has many contrasts with this estimated 471,000 square miles, which all consist of mountains, rivers, and deserts, all in one place. So this consists of land, water, um, even though Ethiopia is at the bottom of the Blue Nile, and it's 7,444 kil uh, kilometers of water, it's still landlocked country, which means there's, it has no coastline by a major body of an ocean. Now, the religions, uh, the modern religions of Ethiopia are Christianity, Islam. There are other traditional East African beliefs, um, indigenous to the people. Um, of course, historically, a lot of Ethiopians long before Christianity, they uh, they followed uh, the deity Ra. So this deity was not just isolated to Egypt. It was Ethiopian concept. Matter of fact, it was a, a Batwa. It was a Congolese concept. But we'll talk about that another day. And Christianity is the most popular religion, uh, that of 61%, which the nomination is the Catholic Church. However, its climb to into prominence was not an easy one. In the early fourth, fourth century, during the reign of the Roman Empire, Christianity had become the established religion of the Eastern world. Since trade was the medium, was the main way they were able to communicate and make things happen, since trade was the medium, it dominated the Red Sea and it spread. And it spread to other areas by way of the Axum Kingdom. It was automatic. So according to Kevin Shillington in his book, History of Africa, the aggressive external expansion of Christianity came through the Sahagwe dynasty during the 1150 AD. Sahagwe kings commanded a large army and Christian settlement and control. Uh, they pushed further south, like Tana, okay, and new conquests were supported by the presence of missionaries. This gave way 
This gave way to constant communication between the Church of Ethiopia and the Holy Land of Jerusalem. And after being in fellowship with the Egyptian Coptic Church, the Ethiopians would soon evolve to make their own religious system with its own individual characteristics. Now, the Ethiopian people saw themselves as the outpost of Christianity, the chosen people, direct descendants of ancient Israel. The ritualistic belief stems from the Old Testament. According to Shillington, around uh, 1270 AD, a new line of kings emerged called the Solomonid Dynasty. They justified their descendants of power by claiming that they were the direct descendants of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba, their son, through their son. They both gave birth, uh, they had a son named Menelik first. Now, of course, Dr. Ben would, would uh, would debate this concept as far as how would the Queen of Sheba, who uh, her name was Makeda, Queen of Sheba would go from a powerful nation, from a nation that didn't want anything and didn't need anything to go and visit South. Okay? You know, that's that's debatable. But as the story goes, they had a son named Manalik the first. It's also believed that Manalik received the Ark of the Covenant. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Exum believes that that according to the book of Hebra Nagast, or the book of the Glory of Kings, the Ark in, is located in the chapel and the tablet uh, is at the church called Our Lady of Mount of Zion. Now, three major kingdoms um, developed or evolved uh, out of Ethiopia. Okay? They were the Axum, the Zagwe, and the Solomon dynasty. These three major dynasties. These, the Axum dynasty, according to scholars, was an important trading nation in the northeastern part of and in its pride, the kingdom of Exum controlled North Ethiopia, Tria, and Sudan, Southern Egypt, <clears throat> Yemen, Somalia, and even Saudi Arabia. By the third century, Exum began to mint its own currency. We had our own money. So between the years 3, 325 AD to 328, the nation was converted to Christianity under, under the rulership of King Zion. At the 6th century, the kingdom began to decline, and it finally was succumbed by invasions of the Jewish queen, Kadit, in the 9th or 10th century, resulting in the rise of the Zagwe dynasty. Now, the Zagwe dynasty dominated Ethiopia from the end of the Axum Empire to 1270, when uh, Kunu Amalek was killed during the, last, during the battle. It is believed that the word Zagwe came comes from the Agal people, meaning of Agal. Z means uh, of in uh, Ge'ez. So once again, the word Zagwe comes from the Agal people, meaning of Agal. Z means of. Okay. So the dynasty came from the Christian princely family of the Agal people. Founder was Mauro Takla Hayamanat, the son in law of the last king of the Axum, Dil Na'ad. Additionally, the number of kings belonging to this dynasty is unknown. It's possible that the number of kings is about 16, and the total years of the reign spans from 133 to 333 years. Still debatable, right? The king that was the most known was Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel Mesquiel Lalibella. Yeah, Gabriel Lalibella, who was responsible for the rock hewn churches of Lalibella. Lalibella, I'm sorry. Despite of such accomplishment, the last king uh, of the Zagui dynasty is unknown. Most scholars believe that the king was Yetzbarak. Now, so we have the Exum dynasty, we have the, the Zagui dynasty. Now we have the famous Solomon, Solomon dynasty. It is the most known in the traditional house of the royalty in Ethiopia. The motto of the dynasty was the scripture from the book of Psalms, Ethiopia, Tabish, and the Hebi is exhibited, which meant 
Ethiopia stretched her hands unto the Lord. I am to the descendants of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba, who is said to have given birth to Manalek the first. Then when Amalek overthrew the last king of Zagreb, he then claimed the direct male descending line from the ancient Exumite kingdom, which the Zagreb overthrew. Now I would tell my students that 80%, whether I would say not, not 80, that's real high, the majority of the African nations and kingdoms were matrilineal, not patrilineal. Patrilineal. Matrilineal means your royalty, your royal line came through your mother and not the father. In this case, Ethiopia, the, the royalty or the bloodline came through what? The father. Right? So the empire, so Amalek overthrew the last king and he claimed direct male descended line from Azamite kingdom, which was overthrown. The empire itself expanded and contracted over, over the centuries. In its highly controlled parts of Sudan, Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and Kenya, Malik II and Hale Selassie established the southern regions in the last two centuries. Now, the famous Emperor Hale Selassie adopted the imperial coat of arms, which is an imperial throne flanked by two angels, one holding the sword, and a pair of scales, the other holding the imperial scepter. According to uh, some sources, the throne is often shown with a Christian cross star of David and the crescent moon. This eludes the Ethiopian connection to the three world's major religions that are Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And religiously speaking, um, Ethiopia has played a major role in all three at one point in time or another. It now the coat of arms is on a red mantle, an imperial crown, and is before the line of the tribe of Judah. Now the line of the tribe of Judah itself is the center of the tricolor flag during the rule of Hail Selassie. Hence the phrase uh, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah was on the arms. Okay, which always went before the title of the emperor himself. And you see that not just in modern times, but in ancient times, they would be uh, our ancestors, uh, the pharaohs and many others would put their title, put a handle before their name, okay? So it could be son of the sun, or it could be Candide or whatever. It would be that, that title, then their name. So that's why I tell my students names are very important, okay? It's good to know the name, but know their full name. Now, Emperor Theodoro, so Theodore II, he lived to 1818 and 1868, reigned for 13 years. His birth name was Casa Hale uh, Jigoris, but was regularly called Casa Hilu, which means in Gaz restitution or, and his power. He established Ethiopia as a modern African power. He expanded the military force into a national, national army he gained central control of Ethiopia. According to Shillington, he expanded his own military force into a national army, drilled, disciplined, salary, trained in the use of modern weapons. It's okay to have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding and to have cities and money, but it's another thing to have a standing military. It's okay to, to, to write books and petition and appeal, but if people do not have the muscle to substantiate their claims, We're just talking, right? Now, during 1855 to 1861, local rebellions rattled the country because the nobility tried to assert their independence from the centralized government control. Once again, division amongst the ranks, right? The nobility hostility was turned towards the emperor when he tried to suppress them. Without the aid of the church's attempts of suppressing the revolts were futile. Okay, in 1868, Toridos or Theodore was arrested a British consul, which led to a huge march of 30,000 men to rescue the consul. Because the British people wanted to meddle their business, meddle into the affairs of Ethiopia, which you know they should not have been there. The guy was arrested, 
Then Britain, the Britain, the British find out, here come this army. Only with the manpower of 4,000 people, the emperor was overwhelmed and he committed suicide on the battle. What if Sudan got involved? What if Kenya got involved? I think the odds would have been in our favor. Unity is important, y'all. Emperor Melanet II, 1844 to 1913, ascended to the throne in 1889 after the death of Johannes IV. He led a large army which used modern weapons. For many years, Melanet has been uh, in position. He positioned himself in the region of the Southern Empire. In the north, he was confronted by imperial ambitions of Italy and was forced to recognize the Italian coastal colony of Istria between 1887 and 1890. At the Battle of Adawa in 1896, he was able to defend the country from foreign rule. He would later establish the capital of Addis Ababa. Now, our Empress Zelditu was baptized as Ascala Miriam. She was born in 1876. The Empress Zelditu was the first lady to be recognized as ruler in Africa on the international level. She was the eldest daughter of Madeleine II, Lady and Lady Abek. Even though the Emperor Madeleine had three children, Zerditu, uh, Asafo Wilson, and Shiwa Raga, uh, Zerditu remained the closest to the royal family. She was the last uh, direct descendant of the Solomon dynasty. At her coronation, February 11, 1917, first in Ethiopian history, European officials attended the event. Now, mind you, Africa has, has had powerful rulers for centuries. This is the first time they want to show up? I don't know. This is 1917. This is during World War I. They may be trying to play nice. Hmm. I don't know. Right? At her coronation, they did come. The D2 was summoned to the capital. And on September 27, 1916, the Council of State and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church officially deposed Aisu in favor of Zadita. Her official title is Negesti Negas, Queen of Kings, a modification of the traditional title Nugus Negas, King of Kings. Hmm? Interesting. Queen of Kings. Very, very uh, similar to the pharaonic title of the queens in Egypt, the Lady of the North and South. According to Marcus, uh, the to pledged to rule justly and fairly. Now, the aristoc- uh, aristocracy, I'm sorry, aristocracy was supportive of her reign, but her relatives were not amused. The D2 stepmother and aunt of her husband, uh, Empress Tatu, was still alive and lived in the capital. Was upset. She got the crown. They didn't. The last will and testament of Emperor Melanet II was that Lige Ayushu would succeed him. However, the empress would oftentimes suffer guilt by taking the throne from him, in result of which would spawn a war against Ayushu. Hmm. It's a good division among even our rulers. With the help of his father, noble Negus Michael Abuelo, a powerful leader of the North, they would team up in order to overthrow Zedito. So these guys came together to overthrow a woman. Hmm. However, they both failed, and Gusa Araya, her husband, captured Ayesha. He pleaded to the courts that he would be... He, that he be imprisoned in the family estate and was still eat raw food. He said, look, I'm wrong, but hey, can y'all, you know, uh, do me a favor and not put me in the prison with regular folk. Put me, just put me on house arrest. And they, to the end of their life, she still would refer him to, to him as royal. She still respected him. However, she then met opposition from Rastafari, and then that's when she gave up hope. Moreover, her reign was under constant threat because of her gender. It had nothing to do with her titles, her gender. She was not able to rule completely and freely. In an attempt to limit her influence, the 
the aristocracy arranged Empress a nephew to a, and husband Ras Gasa really to be appointed to remote governorship, removing him from court. So they use people in her camp to curve her. Thing. Her eventual separation from her husband as well as family disputes make her reign an unhappy one. Cousin Rastafari was soon be the one in control. At the end of her career, she spent most of her time in prayer, fasting, as well as other religious activities, and would soon withdraw herself from political affairs. This, in turn, would give Rastafari more, more leeway to the monarchy. In the 1930s, Ed II bestowed the title uh, Negus uh, Tafari Mekene, even though Tafari did not have complete rule over Ethiopia, he still sustained much power. Later, Zaditu's husband got, uh, would uh, lead a rebellion against the fire in Begmender, and but he would be killed in battle in March 31st, 1930. On April 1932, two days later, he died. Modern autopsy states that she died of diabetes and, and was seriously ill. Popular belief was that she died of shock when she found that her husband died in battle, died of a broken heart. It's unlo- this is unlikely she would not have known of the outcome yet. With the untimely death of her husband and rise of Rastafari, speculators believe that there was a conspiracy concerning her death. She was the last monarch to receive a state burial uh, rice at the end of her death, and also the last. Now we know later on Rastafari, he would eventually get those burial rights. Now, Empress lived a life not a fairy tale. Ironically, it sounded more like a life of the lady who lives next door, which dealt, which had had a hard life. She had the title, she had everything, but she didn't have the support. She had the ancestry, she had the lineage, but she didn't have support. The predecessor to Hail Selassie. Empress Zedetu, born in April 29, 1876, was the early symbol of women's independence whose end is shrouded in mystery. And so we have to pay attention to these things. We have to support each other, especially our black women. Okay? We got to put all petty differences and ideologies aside and rise up and do what's best for our community and our family. And we know she broke a lot of ground despite but she was still the gun queen of Ethiopia. So this is King Cam's and Jubei's podcast and Jubei Lee's message. And today's message is the forgotten queen of Ethiopia, Empress Zedita. This was written, I wrote this uh, in college years ago. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please like, uh, comment, share, or even follow like to sponsor the show, feel free to email me at kingcam at nsfatherhood.org. And if you want to further this discussion, feel free. Um, let's make it happen. All right? You guys have a good one. Talk to you later.